Hello, and thank you for coming to the Tri-Cities Historical Museum's first virtual program for the History of Highland Park exhibition, now on display through May 30th, 2021. My name is Kate Crosby, and today I'm going to be sharing with you how I researched Highland Park and in general how to go about fact-finding for historic houses. So the History of Highland Park is our exhibit in the small gallery here at the Tri-Cities Historical Museum, and it really explores the Highland Park neighborhood of Grand Haven from when it began in 1886 to the present day. As many of you may know, when you are researching a historic house, it can be quite difficult sometimes to find accurate information, especially if it's built before there were building permits, which is generally the 1950s in the US. This can be complicated, but through this presentation, I'm hoping to be able to share with you how I went about it and any resources that you can use to find out more about your home if you're interested. These are the basics of the Highland Park neighborhood. These are the very first facts that I learned and what I had to start with. So Highland Park was incorporated in 1886 based on a lease of land from the city of Grand Haven to the Highland Park Association, which was made up of mostly businessmen from Grand Haven. There were a couple from Spring Lake and a handful from Grand Rapids also. When it was leased, it became classified as the Highland Park Edition to the city plat map. So there was the original plat and then the Highland Park addition to it. It was very handy in researching these plats because they have a very short legal description for the most part, like Highland Park Edition, Lot 33, which is super easy to find and to do research on. In 1952, the city declined to renew the Highland Park Association's lease. So instead, what they did was they offered to sell off all of this property to Highland Park Association and to the cottage owners. So individual cottage owners purchased the land on which their cottages stood, and the Highland Park Association bought different uh, parking lots, common areas, so that they could continue to maintain them. Now, my first and most important piece of advice whenever you're doing any kind of historical research is not to reinvent the wheel. But check and see, is there already research out there that someone has done that I can build on? In my case, I was very lucky to have Karen Lowe's book, The Historic Cottages of Highland Park, which she self-published in 2019. In this book, she outlines the history of 52 of the cottages in the neighborhood, so it's just about half. Sometimes researchers and authors like her are willing to share information that did not appear in their published work, it was very convenient and very kind of them. So it, it never hurts to politely ask. And in my case, I was able to do this with Karen and she was extremely helpful in giving me information that really helped push the exhibit to the next level. So you might be thinking this is great if you are one of the 52 cottages that's mentioned in her book, uh, but what about the other cottages? Well, I know for a fact that Karen is coming out with a new book, but suppose that you wanna get a jump on it for your own personal cottage. This is where you have to become a little bit more creative in your research. Generally, the first place you should look is your local historical society or your library's local history and genealogy room. They have all sorts of fantastic resources, things like historical newspapers, letters, diaries, journals, local histories written by community members, photographs sometimes, and more importantly, they will know where to point you if they don't have particular types of records, which is equally valuable information. For us here in Grand Haven, uh, specifically when researching the Highland Park neighborhood, the Laudit District Library is really the best place to start. They know what types of records they have and where other records are, who to contact, how to get permission, all of those fantastic things. They're going to be the best and most helpful people to contact first. So at Laudit, I use things like digital copies of the Grand Haven Tribune, archival searches, historic photos. They actually have the Grand Haven Tribune digitized and searchable, which is pretty convenient. We'll talk about that in a second. They also have access to resources such as Ancestry.com, Newspapers.com, Fold3, a couple of other paid genealogy and historical research sites that you can use for free on a library computer. You do physically have to go in, but then you can use these resources without having to pay any money, which is pretty awesome. So this is what their page looks like. And uh, at the end of this slideshow, I'll actually have links for everything, et cetera, so you guys can see all of that. But I wanted to have this up on here to show you the different types of things that they have. So when you visit the local history and genealogy department, they have vital records. That's things like 
birth dates, death dates, weddings. They have oral histories. There's some real gold in here. Um, they have some of them transcribed, not all of them. But if you want to find out from the people who lived during this particular time, what kind of information they had, I saw some really interesting stories about the dummy line that were only available in the oral histories. They have these atlases from 1849 to 1930. Directories, these are the directories that were written by Wally Ewing. So they're very broad in their coverage and they don't tend to cover subjects very deeply because they're covering all of Northwest Ottawa County, all of the people, all of the buildings and sites, all of the businesses and industries. So it's a good place to start to find out more information. And the last thing I wanna point out on this page is this archival search box. So Laudit District Library uses Past Perfect Online, and you can find photographs, manuscripts, letters, historical documents of other flavors on their site there. It's incredibly convenient to use, and it's a great way to find out if you need, for example, an image without a watermark or an image that has you know, a higher resolution, possibly that will get you started because you can contact them then about a specific item as opposed to just, you know, all of Highland Park. It's pretty broad. So the county atlases, I just wanted to show you guys a couple of these to sort of give you a picture of what you can see and what you can't see. For the 1897 atlas, that's the first atlas where the area that has become Highland Park was actually shown. Earlier atlases were very much focused on just the original plat, uh, downtown area now. But as you can see here, what they have done is just sort of a broad look at where Highland Park is. And it's better than nothing. <laughs> it's great to have confirmation that Highland Park is there and it's leased and it's owned by the city of Grand Haven. It's all great information. The cemetery is right next door. But in terms of the actual usefulness of this for researching specific plats, it's obviously not great. But here in the 1912 atlas, we can see uh, some interesting information. So we can see where the hotel is. We can see that this area was not yet platted out for cottages, so no cottages were built there. The rest of these plats, it gives you some dimensions. And you can see here, we're following along, unfortunately. And this is, you know, the interesting thing about working with historic sources sometimes and scans of them. Um, this is an atlas that's a book. And so when they were scanning it, this was right up against the tail end of the page where the fold is. So you can see between this image and the next one that we've got, uh, we've got some issues. <laughs> it's a little hard to see some of the numbers, but this is something where, you know, if you need a better scan, you can sometimes contact libraries or different organizations who've scanned these things um, and they can try to get you a better picture. But even then, this is a good place to start. In the 1930 atlas, you can see that this still is not platted up here quite yet. We've got the hotel here. We've got all of these different little cottages going on here, again with the dimensions for the plat itself. These are not the dimensions for the cottages. So for that, we would want to look at a different type of source. Well, obviously, I'm going to plug the Tri-Cities Historical Museum too. The library has more historical documents than the museum. That's just a fact. But the museum has a larger collection of 3D artifacts and historical photographs. Generally speaking, if it's 2D, probably the, the library is going to want it. And if it's 3D, probably the museum is going to have it. As a general rule, it's not necessarily uh, exact, however, because I can show you some examples here. These artifacts tend to contain different types of information. So if I'm looking for information on how someone decorated their cottage in the 1920s, it's a lot easier to get that kind of information out of a photograph or out of, you know, like the chairs and curtains and tables and rugs that they use themselves that have been donated to the collection, as opposed to even the most descriptive document writing about these is not going to be as helpful as a photo or the artifact itself. So this is what it looks like when we're researching the artifacts. You get to see a photograph of it that you can actually enlarge. We have the ability to check out what the history of it is, when it was cataloged, when it was donated, um, what the condition is. Uh, obviously, it's not great because it was in a fire. Currently, this information is not available at home for you guys, but we're working on changing that with collective access. 
photographs, we have the same thing going on. We have these photos of the Beechwood Cottages of Highland Park. And these are estimated around turn of the century, maybe a little bit later, 1910. What's really cool about them, though, is that here you can actually see not necessarily the color exactly, but you know what the configuration was of all of these different houses, what porches were attached, where the steps were, all of this other really, really helpful and great information from this postcard. And we can find this information out in our photograph catalog. Finally, we have we do have an archive. <laughs> so these are some of the archival sources that we have. This is a Summer Nooks booklet for Highland Park and is actually currently on exhibit, which is pretty cool. But this is the archival research. We do have some really interesting stuff, just not as much of it as the library. But we have these as a potential resource for you to use when you're researching. Now, currently, like I said, we're using Past Perfect and it does not have the option able to just access over the internet right now. But we're working on transitioning to collective access. And what's going to be really great about that is you can go to our website. You'll see a link saying something like Explore the Collections. You'll click on it and you'll be able to search photograph or island park or spring lake school collective access lets you research these things online and so you don't have to wait for nine to five monday through friday you can do this research whenever you want now we talked a little bit earlier about local newspapers the grand haven tribune is the one that we relied on most heavily you can access it at about its local history room or by making an appointment at kark we have a copy to use with one of our research computers out there. These cover the 1890s to the present, it's kind of thin on the 1890s, but we have almost all of the papers for later years. The Grand Rapids Herald is another source that we did use. Many of the folks who owned cottages in Highland Park actually lived in Grand Rapids most of the time. There was actually a commuter train, so these gentlemen could hop on the train in the morning to go to work in Grand Rapids. And then in the evening, hop on a train back to Grand Haven to spend the summer evening at their cottage with their families, which is pretty neat. Um, so we also used this resource to learn more about the Grand Rapids owners of Highland Park Cottages. Sometimes there was a little bit more information in there than there was in the Grand Haven Tribune from them. One last thing I want to note on this is that there is a Highland Park neighborhood in Grand Rapids. So when you're checking the Grand Rapids Herald, you actually do have to make sure that you're talking about the right Highland Park. It's usually pretty easy to do because they will also mention Grand Haven or mention one of the streets or the pavilion or the hotel. Um, whereas if they're talking about the one in Grand Rapids, they're often talking about like taxes. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to tell in that way. Um, but you will need to use some context clues to figure out if it's the right Highland Park. So when you're searching these digitized newspapers, it's not as easy as I would like it to be. You have to pick the correct search terms. You have to think about the fact that these are digitized and transcribed in such a way that they use optical character recognition. So that's an algorithm within the computer. That's not a person going through and typing out every word. So sometimes they come up with some odd results. Uh, if you look on the left down at the bottom there, you'll see that that was one instance where I found Highland Park and it says to Highland Park something to Mr. Janix, lots of unpronounceable words, Clinton Street. And when I actually looked at the clip of the newspaper, the actual image of the newspaper, I could see lost pocketbook with two bills and a brown glove on road to Highland Park, returned to Mrs. James Reckner, 501 Clinton Street. Right. So that's still not perfectly easy to read. I mean, generally, when you have these sort of oddly preserved text issues where it's really dark and really light in some places, that tends to be where the OCR goes a little bit awry. But much easier to read in this case, the actual newspaper as opposed to the transcribed search. So sometimes that's going to happen. Um, you'll see words that look similar, but are not actually the same word sometimes. So, you know, if you're looking at log, sometimes log looks very similar to dog. And so the way that you just have to go through every search uh, result and check it to see if it's actually relevant. 
So Loudoun District Library has these Grand Haven Tribune papers going back to the 1890s. They're all separate PDFs, so you will want to use advanced search functions there. And if you guys are interested in more of a tutorial on that, you can either email me or Jeanette actually does a wonderful job demonstrating how to do the advanced searches if you're at the genealogy and local history room. So when you're thinking about search terms, and this is true regardless of whether you're looking in the newspaper or looking online somewhere, you want to start a little bit broader. So if you're using search terms like Highland Park or Highland Park Association, Highland Park Hotel, Highland Park Tennis, that's going to get you more results than maybe like Otley Trophy, which was the trophy that was used in tennis tournaments in Highland Park in the 19, late 1920s and 30s. So that might mean that you also get much more chaff with your wheat, but it's better to search through a lot of stuff that might not be 100% relevant to be able to find the stuff that you're looking for. Because sometimes if you're too specific, you lose information and it's not easy to go back and find it, especially with search terms that are specific to cottage addresses, cottage names, cottage owners. When they change, uh, which they did quite a bit, there are only a handful of cottages left that still have the original name and are still in the original family. That makes it much more difficult to find. So if you're looking for a cottage whose name changed in 1905 and then again in 1936, if you're looking for the history of that cottage throughout time, you need to try to search for the name before 1905, the name between 1905 and 1936, and any names that may have come after in 1936. With the exact addresses, you don't necessarily want to do that if you're looking in the 1890s to 1920s, possibly even the 1930s. They didn't have postal addresses for a really long time. You could actually just address it to a specific cottage, like the Gertrude, and they would send it to that cottage. So it was interesting. These cottage names were so specialized that you didn't have to have like a specific postal address the way that we do now and the way that these cottages do now. Another amazing place to look is local government records that are online. So for Ottawa County, we have the Register of Deeds, we have real property searches, we have property mapping on GIS, and the BSNA records for the city of Grand Haven. And I've included that in Ottawa County records because that information actually does come from the county. Um, it's just maintained by the city of Grand Haven. So let's say you're looking for a deed just a document stating that this person has ownership of this particular piece of land. You, there are a couple of different ways that you can search. You can search by a last name or business name, by the dates that you're looking for. The Lieber and Page is where it's actually recorded, like the legal book that this is recorded in. Most people don't really know which Lieber and Page, but you can find that out by searching one of the other items, whether that's a parcel number or something like that, or the document number, and then going in and finding out more about maybe you want to know something that happened right around then or a different piece of property. So for this, this is the type of results that you can see if you search. Um, I just searched Otley, right? That was one of the families that owned several cottages in Highland Park. And what I was able to do, um, they have up to 200 research results displayed. So if you go all the way to the back, because uh, it displays these by date from most recent to oldest. So if you're going in and trying to do this research now, you're going to have to go to the last page of whatever you're looking for to be able to find the really old records. And I found some going back to the 1890s, which is pretty cool. So here we can see that Matilda Otley leased one of the plots that was available. And we have all of these different records showing a quick claim deed, the will, another quick claim deed. And what you can do, you can order copies of these. The county clerk does charge for that. But if you're looking for very specific information and you want a certified record of it, that's you know a good way to get that done. Um, that's why they have the little cart guy over here. You can add the copies to your cart and request them. 
Let me print them for you. When you're looking at real property, this is to get the information about a specific piece of land, not necessarily a specific deed. So all of the records for a particular piece of land, you'll search by owner last name or parcel number or property address. Again, with the property address, since we're looking at places that didn't have property addresses in the very beginning, it can be a little tricky. Um, that's not my favorite way to search for them. Owner last name is pretty handy, but the most useful is actually the parcel number. And you know, when you're looking for these, you want to look for active and inactive parcels, because if the parcel is split, then what they do is each of the new parcels that that original one was split into get new numbers. So you don't want to necessarily just search for active parcels because you'll lose some information that way. So here I did a search to see which parcels were owned by anyone with the last name Crane. Now our top option, we can see that Peter and Cynthia Crane own 27 Crescent Hill. The parcel number for that is 7003293220006. And each parcel in the state of Michigan has been given a unique number. That is the parcel number. So if you know that number, you can get a lot of really good research done and find a lot of information. Now I went in and clicked in. Um, I'm always very curious about the castle. So I clicked in here. You can see that it's an active property that is residential improved, what the approximate acreage is, some of the stuff that's on this website and the BSNA website that we'll get to later, like the active date. That's not like a real date, for lack of a better word. It's more like when they went back and digitized it, what did they put as the active date? Especially when you're looking at something that says January 1st of a year, it probably goes back further. And in the case of the castle, we know that it was a plat. It was a lot much earlier, but that's as far back as whatever program they were using for this would let them go. So you can search for all sorts of stuff, including GIS maps, which are very handy. And that's our next topic. So GIS is Geographic Information System. And Ottawa County maintains a GIS with public search capabilities, which is pretty amazing. So here we can see that I have lined up kind of where this is where Highland Park is. Not too far south. I don't want to hit Doris Court. But you can see all of the different lots are outlined. And if I want to go look at a specific one. So here I have selected 33 Honeymoon Hill. What I can look at with this is just by going to the map and it functions just like Google Maps. It's basically mapped onto a version of Google Maps. I can click on that piece of property and it'll pull up this whole bit of information over here. So I get the parcel number now. Um, this is a great way to search if you're looking for a specific house or a specific address a specific location, but you don't have the address. This is a great way to do it, especially if you match it with like having a Google Street View. You can see some of these cottages from Google Street View, not all of them, because some of the roads are private. But here we can see that legal description that I mentioned earlier. It's lot 33 of the Highland Park edition. That's pretty convenient for our purposes. And we can see the acreage, which is not very much. None of these houses have very much acreage. Now the Grand Haven BSNA is a amazing resource. I love this website. This is how you can search for building records, for building permits, for photographs of some of these houses, property sales. And this is maintained, maintained by the city. Ottawa County is a group that actually puts the information in there. And there are a couple of different ways that you can search up on the top. You can see here you can search different types of records. So whether that's an assessment or a tax, what have you. You can also search by address or name or parcel number. Um, some of these you're a lot less likely to use uh, unless you're actually the owner of the property, like the utility billing account number. But these three up here are really useful in terms of thinking about, I know who owned this or I know what the parcel number is, but I don't know what the address is, or vice versa. It'll give you that information. So here I looked up 26 Crescent Hill using the address search, and I was able to find this parcel, which is for 26 Crescent Hill. So the search results will pop up like this every time if you have typed in the address correctly, uh, which you know sometimes 
mistakes happen. You just go back and recheck your search terms. But here you can see that two results have popped up. We can see this one, which has the parcel number. That's going to be the one that we want to look at. This one with the account number, that's just for the homeowner. That's for things like what their taxes are upcoming. So that one is not really going to be very helpful in terms of looking at the history of the house. So say we click on this and we go through, this is what comes up if we click on the parcel number that we saw on the previous slide. So we have all of this property information. It's a lot. There's a lot of information on here, guys. The year built, this can be a little questionable sometimes depending on the cottage. Some of this is estimates by folks from the county who don't have actual concrete evidence one way or another, which is a little tricky, but stuff like full baths, square footage, et cetera, that's all accurate. It's just the year built. Sometimes it's a county assessor guessing and not actually someone going through archival records and looking, but we can see information on who the current owner is. You can get information about the land. You can get the legal description. So in this case, it probably is 26th lot of the Highland Park edition. Could be fancier, I'm not sure. You can see some sales history. This doesn't go very far back at all. Maybe the 90s. And some building information. Now, that's really helpful when you're looking at, you know, when was this building last updated? So here, I'm looking at a different house, actually, because that one did not have a ton of building permits, and I wanted to show you guys what those look like. So this house, we can see a ton of different building permits, a ton of different projects. It'll actually show you, if you go down to this permit section, you can click on the view button, and it'll show you what kind of permit it was, who the contractors were. Um, so here, one of the permits was to install a wood box fireplace with venting to the outside. So obviously you have to have a contractor who comes in, has that approved, make sure that the city knows that this is happening, which is very important for insurance purposes, among other things. And so it gives you inspection information. So all of that's there. It gives you violation information. This particular record didn't really have any. And it'll show you who the contractor was, who the applicant was, who the owner is for the property itself, all incredibly helpful pieces of information. And so if you're wondering, you know, when was that addition put onto my house, my historic cottage or home? This is one way to check if the addition or other work was permitted. Sometimes it's not, it is supposed to be, <laughs> but sometimes folks don't always do the paperwork. So it's of limited help in that sense. If you know for a fact that the previous owner just did it in a weekend, you're probably not going to have this information available on the website. Historical maps are also incredible resources for use. Absolutely incredible. They give you a lot more description and a better sense of the visual as opposed to trying to read through verbal descriptions of what a particular piece of land or property looked like. So we talked about the county atlases earlier. That's why I'm skipping them now. This is the 1900 plat map. Um, these plat maps are kept at the county register of deeds. They do have electronic versions. And if you email them very nicely, they'll send them to you. In this case, this is the 1900 plat map. So you can see here we have the plat for the hotel. And this one actually has the old numbering system. So some of them you can see here. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. Obviously, these today are not numbered that. These are going to be in the 90s and 100s, but it shows you what the old number used to be, which is pretty neat. Here we can see Cutler's Reserve. This is where Wikiup and its neighbor cottages are today, but in 1900 hadn't been divided up into different plots yet. So you can see here that these cottages haven't been built yet. What's neat too is you can see down here we have Walker's Place. So this is where the first pavilion was, which is pretty neat information to have. This was done by the county surveyor's office. It's always going to have a date on it. So this was July 21st, 1900. And usually they have pretty exact coordinates. They usually have scale. So it's a very helpful way to get a look at this property. And you can see here we have the inner urban line. It shows you where all of the different pieces that make up Highland Park are. The 1911 plat map gives us a bunch more information. 11 years have elapsed. Now we want to know more about some of these cottages. What's really, really nice about this one is that it also includes the names of the cottages if they were named. 
and actually even like the outline, you can see here what the shape of the exterior of the building looks pretty neat. So here we have the dance hall and pavilion and bathhouse where people would go get changed into their bathing suits and back out. Um, so you can see that it was quite convenient to be able to go there. We have the town pump. This is where they had water pumped in by the city before they had piping through individual houses, which is pretty neat. Looking at plates three, four, and five, you get a view of different cottages. They all kind of connect. So if you were to lay them out one by one, you can make one larger map, um, which we actually did for some of the research that we were doing, to try and get a bigger picture of it if you physically print them out. But even in this digital version, it's very helpful to see where there's future plotting or where they had estimated that there would be cottages but there are not cottages today. <laughs> so they had this platted and then they changed their minds and decided to turn it into a parking lot instead, which was pretty neat. Now, one thing I want to highlight that is too cool not to talk about, even though it doesn't feature Highland Park, are the Sanborn fire insurance maps. These are on the Library of Congress online database. So you can find them for Grand Haven, Spring Lake, Ferrysburg, sometimes Fruitport. And the years go from like, the 1880s to the 1920s, in some cases the 1930s. But the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company would go to different towns and collect all of this information about the different buildings, including the use, the materials, how many floors, and they would make these incredibly elaborate maps. So you can see here, this map is from 1883, and very little of these towns is actually mapped, right? You have like a small section of Ferrysburg, basically just downtown for Grand Haven. Now here, we can see that some, because of the expanding industry, some of these neighborhoods that were not mapped out here are now going to be mapped out. So they're multiple pages. This bright colored square here shows what page number you're looking for when you're looking at the like actual detailed map as opposed to this top down. Um, but they always have a key, which is very helpful. It tells you the different colors, what they mean, et cetera. And we also have ancestry.com and other genealogy websites. So when you're looking for information on the buildings themselves, these aren't necessarily the most useful, but if you want information about the owners, these are invaluable. I use these sites so much to trace owners, ownership changes, where they were living, other hard to find details that you're not necessarily going to find in some of the other resources we've talked about earlier. Now, Ancestry is not free to use from home. Um, you can sign up for your own account if you want to. You can make trees on there. Or if you, like me, like budgeting, you can go to the library. It's very convenient to do, and it's very easy to do. They have a multitude of sources that you can use. And some of these they do have exclusive access to, so you're not going to be able to find any of these particular sources on other sites necessarily. No, it's not all of them, you know, so there are city directories elsewhere, there are vital records elsewhere. But for some of the censuses and other record collections, Ancestry.com is the only place that you can get them. But it's not the only game in town. We have other useful sites like FamilySearch.org, and mygenweb.org. Family search is free. You can use uh, a site for tree building. You can use it for research. A lot of it is generated by other users. So people will put in the information that they have. And that means that it is sometimes a little bit more interesting to try to figure out what's fact and what's fiction or what's myth. But what's really handy is that folks will often put scans of documents that they have the record for. They have the actual document itself. And if it's in a private person's hands, it's not going to be on Ancestry. So people can do that also on Ancestry.com. I found it's very hit or miss whether or not someone's descendants actually do that. FamilySearch.org seems like more people are putting those types of records up. Uh, MyGenWeb.org is a grassroots genealogy site. Um, if you go to the website itself, the web design leaves something to be desired looks very early 2000s, late 90s, but they have some resources that these other sites don't have. And in particular, some of the military history information about who served from a particular area in World War I or World War II or the Civil War has been incredibly helpful. 
So for this research, um, for this exhibit, we had to start after COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. And as a result of that, since all of the government offices were shut down, all of our research had to be done online. And that's not normally how we like to do it. Um, historians love to go into the physical archives themselves or into the government office and you know get our nose in really old papers and all of that good stuff. But um, when in-person research is possible again, you can check out some of these offices, like the Ottawa County Clerk's Office. Currently, they're only doing stuff, um, and that's for the county clerk as well as the courts. They're only scheduling appointments for things like emergency applications. Um, and as much as I love history, it's not an emergency, so probably not going to be able to get an appointment for that, but it's always worth a shot to check and see. Uh, the Ottawa County Clerk's Office has a research computer at the office on Fillmore. It's free to use, but for certified copies of the records, you have to pay $15. And that's where someone actually like comes and notarizes the document and it's official official. You don't necessarily need any of that unless you're like trying to prove past ownership for a lawsuit or something like that. The court records, you're going to want to contact the correct court, whether that's the district court, circuit, or probate to find out what their process is post-COVID. Uh, they don't have a ton of information online right now on that, just because the reality is right now that we can't get in there. And they probably aren't even thinking about what that's going to be like until after vaccination is a lot more broadly spread. For court records, you're going to want to contact the correct court, whether that's district, circuit, or probate, to find out what the exact process is going to be post-COVID. I know that in searching online, I wasn't able to find a ton of information about how the process is going to look or how it looks right now. In fact, everything is on appointment. And again, for emergencies, like emergency applications for different court processes. Some of the records that they do have are digitized, which is pretty neat. Um, they have those court records available online, but not for anything that occurred before 1988. So if what you're looking for happened after that, you might be in luck. If you're looking for a piece of really old history, you're probably not going to find it unless you go in person to the court or to the county clerk. Again, soon, hopefully soon, but not currently. Now, here I've wanted to list some of the resources that I used and that I'm encouraging you guys to use that I've talked about today. So first off is obviously Karen Lowe's book, The Historic Cottages of Highland Park, which she self-published. You can find copies of that here at the museum most of the time, a couple of other spots. You can check the Loudoun District Library's local history and genealogy room. I've included a link right here. The Ottawa County GIS, again, that's Geographic Information System. That's the link there for that. Ottawa County Register of Deeds search and the real property search. I've given you the direct links here. So you don't have to click around in the Ottawa County main website because there's a lot of stuff on there, a lot of great information. But if you're looking for something specifically about a deed, you don't necessarily want to get down in the weeds there. More research resources. We have the City of Grand Haven BSNA homepage. The UID is identifying the actual governmental unit. So in this case, the City of Grand Haven, because if you just go to bsaonline.com, it's not going to be helpful at all. The Library of Congress Digital Collections, what I've done here is giving you the link to all of the digital collections that they have. On the slide where I was talking about the Sanborn Maps, I've given you the link directly to the Sanborn Maps collection for Grand Haven. So go back there and put that one in if you already know, you definitely want to check those out. But the Library of Congress has a ton of really great stuff. So I suggest just spending some time on there checking everything out. We have Ancestry.com, Family Search org and mydenweb.org. The Ottawa County Clerk's Office, this is their contact information, so you can get in touch with them if you'd like to. Their phone number is 616-994-4531, and I recommend calling them before doing anything else. Um, they're open Monday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now, if you're interested in coming and visiting us, we would love to see you. The research contact information is listed here. We have the main building, so if you're interested in coming in and checking out some of the exhibits, et cetera, you can come to the 200 Washington Avenue address. But if you're looking at researching archival records or you want to go see an artifact, you're going to be going to our 172nd Avenue address, which is 14110. 
172nd Avenue that's down by the Speedway on 31. You'll be getting in touch with Jared Yax, who's our collections curator and offsite facilities manager. And the link that I have at the bottom there is for our collections page, which talks about the process for how to get in touch with them a little bit more and has a link to this amazing form, which is the research request form. So you can fill this out, email it or fax it if you still have a fax machine to the collections department and they will try to get in touch with you as soon as they can. Um, they want to get as much information from you as they can. And if you can fill this out ahead of time and then send it to them, it's really helpful because they can do some research ahead of time before they even get back to you. And then they know what kinds of questions they need to ask. So this really expedites the research process. If they find out that so-and-so was born on this date and what are you trying to look for about them? Great, great resource. Now, if you guys have any questions, feel free to send an email my way. My name is Kate Crosby again. I'm the Exhibits Curator and Facilities Manager here at the Akeley Building for the Tri-Cities Historical Museum. And my email address is kcrosby at tchmuseum.org. Thank you.